Hello everybody, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield chest x-rays that crop up in medical school final exams. So the Medicine Guide is a free online YouTube channel which aims to support medical students all throughout their entire medical school journey. So I've got videos on how to be successful in the preclinical and clinical years. I've got videos on high yield paediatric topics. I've got videos on high yield obstetrics topics for medical school final exams. I have a cardiology edition and this edition is focusing on the high yield abdominal x-rays, chest x-rays, CT head scans, nerve palsies, rheumatology and orthopedic images that crop up in medical school final exams. So if you like my YouTube videos then please can you subscribe to my YouTube channel, please give me a thumbs up and also share my channel with your friends. So without much further ado, let's get started. So today's video is going to involve a quiz focusing on the 10 high yield chest x-rays that crop up in medical school final exams. So I'll present the chest x-ray on the screen. You'll have about 10 seconds to write down what you think is the diagnosis and then we'll discuss it in more detail. So if you feel that 10 seconds isn't enough time for you, then please feel free to pause the screen for as long as you like, and then press the screen when you think you're ready to hear the explanation. So if you've got your pen and paper out ready, let's get started. So this is our very first chest x-ray, so I'll give you 10 seconds. Otherwise you can pause the screen. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. So this chest x-ray is an example of a pneumonia. Now there are different types of pneumonias. There's a community acquired pneumonia, a hospital acquired pneumonia, and also aspiration pneumonia. So if you want further detail on pneumonia, then please have a look at my pleuritic chest pain for finals because it talks about pneumonia in a great amount of detail. Now, the key things to remember about pneumonia is that a chest x-ray is your gold standard investigation and your Curve 65 score is really important in terms of triaging patients who are presenting with different severities of pneumonias and also depending on their severity, it also affects the type of management plan that is required for that particular patient. Now, this patient has a pneumonia affecting the right lower lobe now, a pneumonia affecting the right lower lobe or the right lower base is quite a classical description for potentially an aspiration pneumonia. And that's something that you need to keep in mind. OK, so let's have a look at the next image. So again, you've got 10 seconds to come up with a diagnosis or you can pause the screen. Okay, so this chest x-ray is an example of COPD. Now the classical findings of COPD on a chest x-ray involves a patient who has hyperinflated lungs and a flattened diaphragm. Now Haemophilus influenza is a microorganism which commonly leads to COPD exacerbations and that's something that you definitely need to keep in mind in terms of your knowledge exam papers because a common exam question they can ask is what is the underlying organism that leads to recurrent COPD exacerbations and if you find Haemophilus influenza on your list of answer choices you should tick that answer and move on to the next question. It's a very simple question and hopefully today's video will help remind you that Haemophilus influenza commonly leads to recurrent COPD exacerbations. Now, the gold standard investigation for COPD is to perform spirometry before and after using bronchodilators. Because COPD is an obstructive lung disease similar to asthma. However, unlike asthma, a patient will still have an FEV1 over FEC less than 70% after receiving bronchodilators. Whereas in an asthmatic patient, you will see an improvement in their spirometry after using the bronchodilator. So that's a very key differential to be aware of and it's a very key investigation to remember. So post-bronchodilator spirometry is your gold standard 
for COPD because these patients will still have F an FEV1 over FEC less than 70% after using the bronchodilator. There is no bronchodilator reversibility in COPD patients. However, in asthmatic patients, there is bronchodilator reversibility. Okay, so let's have a look at the third chest X-ray. So again, you can pause the screen if you like, or you can wait 10 seconds, it's up to you. Okay, so this is an example of TB. Now TB is commonly due to a mycoplasma tuberculosis infection. Now the classic chest x-ray findings of TB involves bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy and the presence of a ranky complex. So on the chest x-ray you can see these calcified little nodules quite close to the hyalur region and that's going to be your ranky complex. Now the management of TB is a very high yield exam question. So the mnemonic that I use is RIPE. So the first two months, patients will need to have RIPE management. So they need to receive rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Then the remaining four months, they just need to use rifampicin and isoniazid. So for the first two months, they use all four of the drugs that make up the right pneumonic. And then for the next two months, they just receive the first two drugs in the right pneumonic. So rifampicin and isoniazid for four months. OK, so let's have a look at the fourth chest X-ray. So again, I'll give you 10 seconds to come up with a diagnosis or you can pause the screen if you like. Okay, so this is an example of bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is a pulmonary disease where patients are exposed to recurrent inflammation or these patients have a chronic infection. So essentially their airways are permanently dilated. So a chest x-ray is your first line of investigation performed in patients with bronchiectasis and the classical description of a chest x-ray is that these patients are presenting with a tram track appearance. Now your investigation of choice in bronchiectasis is to perform a high resolution CT scan and on a high resolution CT scan the classical signet ring sign is found. So if you have a look at the CT scan at the bottom of the screen you can see a blue arrow is pointing towards the classical signet ring sign appearance and I've also got a picture of a signet, right, signet ring on the far right hand side to help you remember. And a common question that crops up is that you'll be given a list of potential respiratory conditions and you'll be asked to identify which of these conditions are considered to be an obstructive lung disease or a restrictive lung disease. And bronchiectasis presents with an obstructive lung disease. So the way that I like to remember this is that bronchiectasis contains the letter O, and so therefore O in bronchiectasis helps me to remember that this is an obstructive lung disease. Okay, so let's have a look at question number five. So you can either pause the screen if you like, or you can wait 10 seconds. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. So this is an example of a pleural fusion. So if you want to find out more about pleural fusions, please have a look at my pleuritic chest pain for finals because I've spoken about pleural fusion in quite a lot of detail. But in today's chest x-ray, let's have a look at the classical findings of a pleural fusion, which involves the meniscus sign, so that nice U-shaped bend that you can see on the right base, and also the loss of the costophrenic angle. Another key point to remember when learning about pleural fusions is that a classical exam question will ask you to differentiate between an exudative and a transudative pleural fusion. So please try to remember the common causes of an exudative and transudative pleural fusions. 
If you can't remember, then please have a look at my video where I've explained it in a lot of detail. And the definitive diagnosis, so the confirmatory diagnosis for a pleural fusion, is to perform an ultrasound and guided pleural aspirate. Okay, so let's have a look at chest x-ray number six. So again, I'll give you 10 seconds or you can pause the video, it's up to you. Okay, so this is an example of miliary TB. So a chest x-ray finding of miliary TB describes the classical snowstorm appearance. So miliary TB is essentially where a TB granuloma has eroded a blood vessel or a lymphatic vessel. So now the TB has disseminated and is now spreading systemically around the body. So patients who are at risk of miliary TB are immunocompromised patients. These patients might suffer from AIDS. They might have a current leukemia. Now, the confirmatory diagnosis for miliary TB involves either a bone marrow or a CSF culture. Okay, so let's have a look at number seven. So I'll just give you a few seconds. Okay, let's look at the answer. So this is an example of a pneumoperitoneum. Now a pneumoperitoneum presents on an erect chest x-ray, not an abdominal x-ray, an erect chest x-ray. And a pneumoperitoneum represents free gas in the peritoneal cavity. Now there are lots of different causes of a pneumoperitoneum and you've got to be very confident and familiar with this because it classically presents in exam questions. So some of the causes of a ruptured peptic ulcer can lead to free gas in the peritoneal cavity. Other causes of a neuroperitoneum involves diverticulitis, so that's the perforation of an inflamed diverticular. So diverticulitis is the next step following from diverticulosis. Another cause of neuroperitoneum is a patient who's had a bowel obstruction, but now the bowel obstruction has perforated. Now there are some causes of neuroperitoneum in more pediatric patients, such as necrotizing enterocolitis and a ruptured, uh, and a ruptured appendix. And there are iatrogenic causes of a neuroperitoneum, such as mechanical perforation of the bowel, following on from colonoscopy. So I'll give you a few seconds to find out the diagnosis of this condition. So this is an example of a simple pneumothorax, so please have a look at my video if you want to find out more details. But the classical features on the chest x-ray that you need to be aware of is that patients will present with a collapsed lung and they will present with a flattened diaphragm. You also need to be confident about the causes of a primary pneumothorax and the causes of a secondary pneumothorax. And if you're unsure about this, then please check out my video. Okay, let's have a look at question number nine. So I'll give you 10 seconds to find this diagnosis or you can pause the screen. Okay, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of cannonball metastases. Now cannonball metastases is most commonly associated with a renal cell cancer or choriocarcinoma. Other causes of cannonball metastases or other causes that can present with cannonball metastases involves prostate carcinomas, synovial sarcomas and endometrial cancers. But the most common high yield description of 
cannibal metastases in medical school final exams are often attributed to a renal cell carcinoma, so please keep that in mind. So I'll give you a few seconds to find out diagnosis of this condition. Okay, that's fine at the answer. So this is an example of a tension pneumothorax. So a tension pneumothorax is a life-threatening emergency, so you have to be very competent in managing these patients. If you want to find out more detail, then please have a look at my pleuritic chest pain video where I've explained it in far greater detail. But the key point in management that you need to know is that patients who are suspected of a tension pneumothorax, we need to immediately manage them by performing needle decompression so we insert a needle into the second intercostal space along the anterior midclavicular line. And we should hear a hissing sound. And that hissing sound is representing the air that's escaping. Now, once the patient is stable, we can then perform investigations. But the most important aspect is that we need to immediately perform that needle decompression first before we do anything else. So later on, when the patient is more stable, and later on, you can perform a chest x-ray. So on the chest x-ray, a tension pneumothorax presents with a flattened diaphragm, a collapsed lung. But the key thing to remember is that these patients will have contralateral deviation of the mediastinum and contralateral deviation of the trachea. So on this chest x-ray, you can see that the mediastinum and the trachea are deviated towards the left. And that's because the tension pneumothorax is affecting the patient's right lung. So this patient has got a right-sided tension pneumothorax, which is leading to contralateral deviation of the trachea and the mediastinum. So therefore, the trachea and the mediastinum has been displaced to the left. So just for clarity, if you want a bit more detail, please have a look at my pleuritic chest pain video. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy that quiz. And please can I ask you to like my video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and share with your friends. Thank you very much for watching today and I wish you all the best with your exams.